Thank you, Kelly, for that very nice introduction. And I um, very much enjoyed everything I've heard this morning, but especially Jan's history of events in, in Nottingham, which has been a pivotal city and center for advances in land, uh, starting with Anne. And it's really wonderful to see Anne again after all these years. Uh, and, and all that you've accomplished together, it's, it's just phenomenal. And uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, some random things, uh, progress in LAM, reasons to be optimistic about LAM, a few random weak jokes about Joel and Simon. <laughs> Joel's, Joel's easier than Simon. Simon's so polite, it's hard, to, it's hard to dig. But I hope Joel's online, because I have a few things to say to him. Uh, what LAM patients have taught me, uh, what, what we can do together in the going forward, uh, a few thoughts about Cyrillimus, VEGFD, and steps, next steps, trial updates, and LAM Foundation updates, and some future priorities. So accumulated assets for LAM over the last 20 years or so include our organized, motivated patient community, a very rich understanding of the molecular basis of LAM, and this is not the norm for many of the diseases we deal with in the clinic. We know a lot about the underlying basis of LAM that, that is a truly a gift. Uh, there, are, there, are many, there are networks of expert centers all over the world. I happen to think this, the UK group is, is the best organized, among the best organized, if not the best organized group. I was very impressed with uh, the tour I had yesterday of, of the LAM Center with des designated space for LAM. I don't think that exists anywhere else in the world for, for a clinic that's got a nameplate on the door that says LAM Clinic. I, don't, I haven't seen that anywhere else. Uh, the, uh, the, the laboratories that's right next door to the lab and the, all the staff and personnel devoted to LAM, it's really amazing. <clears throat> uh, the um, research registries, tissue banks, and data centers that we have for LAM around the world. We now have an effective suppressive therapy. And we have this useful diagnostic, prognostic, and predictive biomarker, VEGFD, which helps us with diagnosis and I think can also help us with planning therapy in the clinic. And we have invaluable partnerships with the tuberous sclerosis community, with our own national uh, health ministries, and, and, and then I should also include Japan, but National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has been wonderful to LAM. I can see that NHS has been wonderful to LAM. And, the Japanese ministry has been wonderful to land. And uh, the partnerships we have between these international communities, I think, is really uh, special for, for, uh, among any diseases, but especially for rare diseases. I think uh, another asset that we have is this pervasive optimism that this problem is scientifically tractable and it's approachable. We know the molecular basis. We have a lot of ideas for targets, all based on very solid understanding of the biology. And we have it, this, uh, I think many of us believe in our hearts that this, po this problem is potentially solvable in our lifetime. And I, th I think that's led to a lot of interest in LAM that's out of proportion to interest in other rare lung diseases. I, I recently sat on a NIH study section, and they, they, they're wondering, why do they get all these LAM grants uh, applications in? And it's because, because it attracts scientific interest. There's so much known about. Uh, about where we could make progress that, that get, get scientists interested. And uh, <clears throat> this pathway that in, that's involved in LAM interests the world's best scientists because it's, it's a central pathway in, in the cell that controls so many things. And studying this pathway is shedding light on diabetes, obesity, aging, and cancer. And this sounds uh, maybe a little ambitious, but it, it's absolutely true. And, uh, Proof of the pudding is there's about to be a trial of testing rapamycin or sorolimus in dogs to see if it can prolong their lives. And ultimately, of course, the question is, can it prolong a human life? If rapamycin prolongs a life in, in a mouse, mice who take rapamycin live longer. This is not mice with diseases, just healthy mice. Um, and there's, LAM has a lot to teach us about uh, diabetes as well. This pathway is central to di understanding diabetes. So. Uh, this lamb is lucky in this way because the best scientists in the world are, are studying this pathway, not because they're interested in lamb necessarily, but because it's important for so many other things. And lamb is, lamb is a neoplasm, which means it's a new growth. You know, if you get a wart on your finger, that's a neoplasm. That's a growth that doesn't belong there. It's not a cancer because it doesn't move in other places and destroy organs, but it's a, it's a, it's a growth. And lamb is a growth. And it's somewhere on the spectrum between 
cancer and a wart. It, uh, where you put, put that is, is more of a, uh, more of a, your own uh, you know, philosophy. But uh, the, thing, the thing about LAM that should be attractive to people who study cancer is that, m that it can help us sort out cancer. Most cancer cells have dozens of DNA mistakes that, that enable them to disregard all the rules, grow beyond their boundaries, and destroy remote tissues. But in LAM, there's, this, there's a single DNA mistake. And that enables these cells to acquire cancer-like capabilities on the basis of a single mistake. And that makes it much more des des uh, decipherable than, than most cancers. And we can learn something about the Achilles heel for cancer by studying LAM. And I, I truly believe that. <coughs> the, um, more recently, you know, I think one of the things that's been not great about studying LAM is that it, it's taught me, and I think many of us, so much about the biochemistry we never fully learned when we were in uh, medical school. I mean, we really had to go back and, and relearn some things about biochemistry because LAM is teaching us about how this pathway controls cellular metabolism. And the, it's absolutely true that the study of LAM is rewriting these pathways. So when your children go to, uh, or I guess your grandchildren go to high school, the, the Krebs cycle will look different because of the study of, of LAM and tuberous sclerosis. Uh, these are some examples. I don't expect anybody to understand the titles, but uh, these are papers that were funded by patients uh, through the, in this case, the LAM Foundation, that, that, that um, decipher, that tell us something about what cellular pathways LAM is controlling. And in this case, the pathway that uh, is dysregulated in LAM is driving DNA synthesis through this special pathway. And that, that's a target. That's a new target. We understand something about uh, what the LAM cell is doing different from other cells, and that makes it targetable. And this is a, one of the most exciting areas for, uh, for trials in the, in the future, as far as I'm concerned, poisoning the LAM cell's penchant for making more DNA. If you, if you poison that, you might be able to kill the LAM cell instead of just suppress it. Uh, this is another example of a science paper in Science, which is perhaps the most prestigious basic science journal in the world, uh, or Nature Cell. There are two or three of them, but they're, uh, uh, the, the study of LAM is making it to these highest levels of, of uh, scientific publication. And I think LAM stock has never been higher. Um, this FDA approval of MILES has led to approvals now in Russia, Japan, and Korea. Uh, the company that owns this drug, rapamycin, is, is approaching the governments of Brazil and the European Union about uh, approval. Uh, at the uh, National Institutes of Health Rare Disease Day on Leap Day this year, Francis Collins had a 12-minute speech. Four minutes of it was about LAM. And it was the only example of, of a disease that he used in his speech for, for progress. So of the 7,000 rare diseases in the world, he chose LAM to, as an exemplar of, of progress. <coughs> you can view this online, actually. If you Google NIH Rare Diseases Day 2016, it's, it's, it's quite something. Uh, the study, and I mentioned already about the, the textbooks. So these are the three docs in the, in the world who I think think about lamb in the shower. <laughs> and there, there are a hundred docs who write about lamb, but there's, there's three who wake up every day and relate everything to lamb, I think, and who, whose colleagues think about them as the lamb guy. I'm sure Simon is definitely the lamb guy in the UK, and I think people in the US think about Joel and I that way. And I was... Uh, Happy to hear the, the attendance for today was projected to be 93 or 94, because Joel's attendance in, 19, in 2004 was 92. <laughs> but, but then I heard that three people didn't show, so is there anybody out in the hall there that we could? <laughs> so, but my, I'm still, this is the slide I'm gonna send to Joel. Projected attendance, 94, and I'm gonna, I have this little expansion thing too that I put in there. <laughs> and uh, you, Jan has already told you that Simon received the uh, Lamb Foundation Scientific Advancement Award in 2014, which was very well deserved. And um, this was the slide I used to introduce him. Uh, there are three scientists in the world. Actually, this isn't going to work now. It's coming up backwards here, but I'll put everything. 
So there are three scientists in the world who, who don't need first names, the, like Madonna and Sting don't need first names. So this guy, I don't even know, if, does this guy appear in the UK? Yeah. Oh, darn. Well, <laughs> so Joel Olstein, he's a, like a motivational religious guy, and everybody knows who Joel is, uh, and this is the Joel in the United States, and everybody, you know who this person is, <laughs> but nobody in the United States knows who this person is. <laughs> so it's Jilly Cooper, right? In the, this is Jilly Evans, who's, uh, who's our, one of our scientists uh, from uh, New Zealand, who's very animated. This is actually the closest thing to a still photo of her we ever had. <laughs> and uh, then there's this Simon and this guy. I know you know this Simon and, and this Simon. So the, uh, this international partnership with uh, the UK has been extremely important. Uh, and we're writing guidelines together uh, now. Uh, we've, we've, we're actually looking into our populations to look for interesting subsets of patients that, for instance, with unclassifiable lung disease, we'll be writing a paper together about that. Uh, the Japanese were part of uh, the MILES trial. These two guys, uh, Gichi Inoue and Ko Nakata, uh, were, were p pivotal partners in the MILES trial. Uh, at the end of the trial, when they ran out of money, the Lamb Foundation provided them with $150,000 to finish the trial, and this was the slide that Ko Nakata showed. This is supposed to be Sue Burns rescuing Ko Nakata <laughs> and him appreciating in re reciprocation there. Um, he was very proud of this fish, by the way. And uh, <clears throat> I told him that they, they were complaining to me that I was sending him all these documents in English to, to Japan for the Miles trial, and they would have to translate and back translate and how much trouble that, that was. So at the last year's Lamposium, they told me that the official language in Japan is Japanese, and that I should I should understand that. So I said I was um, <clears throat> I meant to show them this slide. I didn't get to it actually, but uh, I said no. The reason I'm not understanding the difference, you know, why, about the nature of the uh, native language in Japan is because in Japan you call this a fish, and in the United States we call this a fish. <laughs> 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 so I, he hasn't seen this slide, but I hope, I hope he's looking. So uh, one of the things that, I, as Jan was saying, about being a part of this community for the last 20 years is just how much we learn from our patients about a lot of things. But uh, I think a joy de vie, jou, jou de vivre, who's, you know, there's a lot of people who speak French in this room, I'm embarrassed, but, and, and courage. Uh, and the people are focused on solutions and living and not problems and dying. And they, it, they, people come to meetings like this, they go to college and finish school, they go through these harrowing experiences with pneumothoraces and transplants and, and emerge, you know, joyful people. Um, I wanted to tell you this story about a patient in the United States. Many of you are online, so you probably know this person, Beverly Hardin Jackson. So she was a tennis, she is a tennis player. Uh, she won her age category in, in 2000 her 50 to 64 category, the Arkansas State Championships. In 2005, she was diagnosed with LAM, and she was too short of breath to play. Uh, so she devised an oxygen system to deliver 15 liters to herself while she was playing tennis. She had got a uh, backpack, and she put oxygen in there. And, uh, but the, the, the commission, the tennis commission in Arkansas told her she can't do that, because she might hurt somebody. So she can't play competitive tennis on oxygen. So she wrote to them and was granted a waiver to use this backpack oxygen while playing. This is her with her, with her backpack. Uh, she won the <laughs> doubles tennis uh, championship the next year in her age group, 60 to 64. Uh, she was started on rapamycin in the MILES trial, and she's been stable since then. And this is her lung function over the course of the last, oh, 10 years or so. Um, and this is a quote from her. I'm playing the best tennis since my diagnosis. My team won the Arkansas State Championship for 65 years and older in 2014, and she contributed to the win. And she said she wouldn't be at Lamposium in 2015 because there's an important uh, tennis tournament that weekend. <laughs> and actually, she's, she's come off. She no longer needs oxygen at rest, which is uh, you know, remarkable after having uh, been on oxygen at rest for a very long time. So in some people, uh, Sirolimus can lead to an improvement in oxygenation. So some of the things we can do together, US and UK, um, we're starting a, a, a registry in the United States called MIDAS that I'd like to do this globally. You're, you're already doing this in the UK in a very effective way 
collecting data um, and, and cataloging <clears throat> symptoms over time. We'd like to do that for all lamb patients. And the, and the original purpose of this is to understand the natural history of what's happening on sirolimus and the long-term effectiveness and safety of sirolimus. But it's also a way to gather information about natural history of lamb. Uh, this study was funded in the United States. It has the ability to become global. Uh, but it's, it's a slog to go through IRB approval and contracting with institutions, so it's taking a very long time to get off the ground. I'll talk a little bit about a trial called MILD, which is uh, what I think is a very important next step in LAM, which is to determine if we should be starting earlier. Because uh, as it stands now, we wait for people to progress or lung function to become abnormal and then we stabilize people sometimes in a not very good place. And it's conceivable that if we started earlier, perhaps we could prevent it from progressing. Uh, so the, the idea is to do the MILES trial again in people who have normal lung function. Uh, and it, it, uh, that's something we're trying to get funded now. Biomarker development is something I think we could do together and something we are already doing together is, is, is developing gu guidelines going forward. So <clears throat> the ERS guidelines you've already heard about from Jan. Uh, it's, been, it's been cited, any of us are happy to have a paper cited more than 100 times. It's been cited almost threefold more than that. It's a very important uh, document. Um, and, but it's now five years old and there have been other developments. So we're, we've developed a, a committee that includes Simon and many people from Europe uh, to develop uh, a, additional guidelines that address issues like <clears throat> the use of sirolimus, whether to use hormone therapy, whether to use doxycycline and how to use VEGFD. These have been, these have been uh, accepted for pr uh, publication and they'll be published probably in the fall. Uh, there's a part two to the guidelines that's uh, circulating. A draft is now circulating. Uh, this is uh, to address issues of, of whether you can use the high resolution CT alone for diagnosis, whether transbronchial biopsy is useful, when you should have pleurodesis in the course of LAM, and whether pleurodesis is a contraindication to transplant. So uh, these are coming. I anticipate the second part of the LAM guidelines will be published in 2017. There's a uh, similar, similar to your registry, there's a registry uh, at, that was conducted at the, uh, through the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in the 1990s, late 90s, and early uh, 2000s, in which patients were followed every six to 12 months for five years. There were only two papers published from that experience, but a lot of time has passed now, and uh, there are a lot of events that have occurred. So th this becomes a very powerful uh, historical database before Sirolimus was in the picture to understand uh, you know, what factors predict progression in LAM, what, what sort of uh, markers we can use to, to understand uh, which people are going to progress and which people are going to be stable. So we've obtained all of the information from this registry. Uh, this, Nishant Gupta is leading this. He's, he's a uh, young, young physician in my group. And uh, he's a, been able to obtain studies about death and transplant from our national agencies that, that, uh, that address those things or that keep uh, records of those things. And since that uh, 15, in the 15 years since this registry was concluded, uh, there have been 53 transplants and 43 deaths out of about 200 patients. So there are, uh, there's a large number of events that can help us define uh, which factors uh, correlate with outcomes of death or transplant. And we'll be looking at VEGFD and other biomarkers, what rate of lung function decline, menopausal status, et cetera. And as I heard Simon mention yesterday, there's also a concept that you could use this to develop a LAM risk calculator. If you can figure out which factors are important, you can plug them into an equation, basically, and, and patients could determine on their own, even online, like we do for whether we should be taking statins or blood pressure medicine. There are, there are online calculators to help you with a risk assessment by just plugging in your data, and a risk factor pops out at the bottom. So it's conceivable we could develop a tool like this for LAM patients to, to help them make decisions about whether, she sh whether that person should start sirolimus and other things. So I was going to say a couple of words about um, ways, ways we use VEGFD and the use of sirolimus in Cincinnati. And, and uh, you've heard some of this already. Um, we use it uh, to make the diagnosis of, of LAM in patients who have typical lung cysts but no other cl clues. And it works about 50% of the time. Not everybody has an elevated VEGFD. If it's, if it's not elevated, it's not very helpful. Uh, 
but it, it does save some people from needing a biopsy. Uh, we have a, a lab in the United States that offers this commercially. It's a little clunky to order. We're trying to fix that. But uh, it is, I think, a useful diagnostic test. It's also useful for decision making when, about when to start treatment. Because if the level's higher, patients in the MILES trial tended, in the placebo group, tended to progress more rapidly. That was the bad news. The good news is if the level of VEGFD was higher, they tended to respond better to treatment, too. So uh, having an elevated or a normal VEGFD can, can figure into the equation of whether to start this drug or not. How do we hope to be able to use VEGFD in the future? It would be wonderful if we could figure out uh, how to use VEGFD to determine the dose of sirolimus that people should be on. We're finding, or I'm finding, that uh, low, lower doses work well. Most of my patients are on one milligram a day and are stable. Not all of them. And in some cases, we've tried one milligram, and lung function continued to decline, and it became clear we needed two. But in most patients, most of my patients are on one. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't want to have to tax somebody for 5% of their lung function to figure out whether they need one or two milligrams. I'd rather have a marker that helps me predict who's going to need one milligram or two milligrams or three milligrams. And VEGFD has that potential because it's in, the, it's in the pathway that's gone haywire in LAM. And if you can reduce it, it's, a good, it's good evidence you're hitting the mark with the drug. So uh, that's, that's a hope for the future. We'll be able to use it in that way. Also, to get an, uh, an early idea of whether sirolimus is going to work at all. Imagine if you started on sirolimus and a month later, you could get a VEGFD level, or two months later, uh, and a, a low level suggested that you'd have a, a good lung function response at a year. That's, that's very reassuring, if it's true. Uh, that's something we can look into. We haven't yet proven that. But it would be wonderful if we had a marker that told us whether we were, uh, whether lung function was likely to respond. And it'll make trials much faster if we can figure out how to use VEGFD as a surrogate. We call that a surrogate endpoint. It's, it predicts uh, uh, the, whether an important endpoint is going to change for the better over time. So if, if we can do that, uh, this and other biomarker could be used to make trials much faster. As it stands now, lung function is a crummy endpoint for trials. It takes too long. It's too variable. Uh, and we'd all like a better, we'd all like a better endpoint. And how do I know if my lamb is going to progress? I know Simon's going to talk a little bit about this. But I think the best indicator that we have is really whether, how lamb has behaved in the past. So if, if lung function has been fast in the past, and by fast I mean 200 cc's per year, it's likely to be fast in the future too. And that isn't, that isn't always true, but it's, it's often true. Uh, and more typical rate of decline in lamb is about 100 to, 70 to 100 cc's of FEV1 per year. Uh, normal for a uh, person who doesn't have lung disease is about 30 cc's per year. So this is about threefold faster than normal. And slow in postmenopausal patients, often we see rates of decline that are in the normal range, 30 to 40 cc's per year. So uh, we use this, I think, more than any other biomarker to try to understand whether someone's likely to progress in the future. If we have historical data, it's very helpful for predicting the future. And it's clear that menopausal status has a big effect. In the MILES trial placebo group, the premenopausal patients lost 200 cc's in a year. The postmenopausal patients, 40 cc's in a year. So there's a five-fold difference in rate of decline uh, in, in patients uh, depending on their menopausal status. And as I mentioned, VEGFD level was useful, uh, is, seems to be useful for predicting rate of decline as well. What patients are we treating with sirolimus? Well, we treat patients with abnormal lung function. And that's, that usually means FEV1 or, or DLCO is less than 70% are predicted or so. And that's based on the fact that these are the patients who enrolled in the MILES trial, and these are the patients we have uh, randomized controlled clinical trial data, <coughs> data about. But uh, you know, over time, many of us are modifying this a bit. You know, if people have gas trapping, you know, maybe that's enough of an indicator of lung function effect that we should consider using sirolimus. I think a lot of us are using, although this wasn't directly tested in the MILES trial, if we see someone who's declining very rapidly, even if they're still in the normal range, uh, we, we think about using sirolimus. And finally, patients who have problematic effusions or other lymphatic complications, sirolimus works very well for lymphatic complications in most people. So uh, al although we only have uh, small case series uh, for, in terms of data for this indication, 
I think we've all been impressed, many of us have been impressed about how well sirolimus works for lymphatic problems. And I mentioned earlier already um, that we're using lower and lower doses and that one milligram of sirolimus a day keeps, keeps most patients stable, but not all. And it's, it's a trick, it's tricky business to try to titrate up and down, risking that lung function might decline while you're trying to figure out what the right dose is, and we need a better marker for that. So is sirolimus safe over long periods of time? This is a very important question. Uh, Simon has some, uh, I saw yesterday, some wonderful data that spans now at four or five years, uh, and some of us have anecdotal experience with patients, with patients who've been on the drug from, for eight to 10 years, but really the only published data uh, for long-term use is by Dr. Moss's group uh, over about a three and a half year period for about 20 patients. So we really don't know yet whether sirolimus is safe and effective for long periods of time. I mean, I think we have a lot of optimism about that, but we need to prove it. So this Midas registry that I mentioned already is our mechanism to try to determine that. Uh, we have already have about 150 patients enrolled in the United States. As soon as we figure out how to get past all the IRBs and contracting issues in the United States, we're going to move on to international sites. Um, and many countries already have a very nice registry that's ongoing. I hope we can figure out ways to merge these and, and truly understand how safe and effective this drug is uh, with large, large numbers of patients. So the question of should we be treating patients early before symptoms develop or any effect on lung function develops? This is a patient named Andrea Slattery. Uh, I have her permission to use this image. She's now the chairman of the board of the Lamb Foundation. She's about 38 years old, I believe. Um, she's a marathon runner. She's a hedge fund manager. She's got a very busy job. Uh, she learned she had Lamb uh, and wanted to, wanted to test some homeopathic approaches to treatment. Uh, she's a marathon runner, and she was noting that her, her exercise tolerance was going down. So she resisted starting on sirolimus for, for a while, and her lung function declined at the rate of about 200 cc's per year until she started on, on sirolimus. Uh, and since then, her lung function has been stable. Uh, so the uh, idea with mild is that perhaps for people like Andrea, we could convince them to be randomized to receive the drug at a low dose or a placebo and then look to see how pe people do over the course of two years and see if earlier treatment can, is safe, effective, early low dose treatment is safe, effective, uh, and effective at reducing uh, rate of decline in a prophylactic way to prevent development of disease. Uh, this is a trial we've been trying to get funded for the last three years or so. It's not as uh, scientifically interesting as, as the MILES trial was when that was presented for funding, so it's been, it's been a little more difficult, but I think it's just as important. I mean, why are we waiting until people are sick and then starting the drug? Why, why couldn't we think about starting the drug earlier if it could be used at a low dose with, at a level that doesn't induce much in the way of symptoms? <clears throat> I think the more we use this drug, the more comfortable we come, become with it. It does have side effects, and we have to respect uh, the potential for adverse effects, but I think at low doses, it can be qu very, very safe. What about people who don't respond? Uh, is there such thing as resistance to sirolimus? I meant to talk to Simon about this yesterday because I've seen only a handful of patients and, and one of the great ironies in this whole story is that the Sue Burns' uh, daughter, Andrea, is one of the people who sirolimus doesn't seem to be doing anything for. So she's declining despite, uh, despite the use of sirolimus. Um, and we'd like to understand why that happens. What's different about Andrea's lamb than other people? Um, and that's, we have a lot of work to do to, to, to get to the bottom of, of issues like this. And again, I think it's the great minority. I think in, in, in all of my phone calls and emails from lamb patients, I probably know of about 10 patients who feel that sirolimus has stopped working for them or never worked for them. And I, I, I want to download from uh, Simon more about what his experience has been. Uh, these are trials that are either completed, now open, or pending in the United States for, and, and around the world for, uh, for LAM. Uh, of course, the, the, we've talked about the MILES trial. There was a similar trial using Everolimus. I said similar. It was a smaller open-label trial, meaning uh, there was no placebo group. There was no control group. Uh, there were 23 patients that were placed on Everolimus, and they enjoyed stability, much like the effect we see with Sirolimus. Uh, it doesn't prove uh, 
safety and efficacy in the same way as a randomized trial, but it's good evidence that these two very similar drugs work very similarly for LAM. Uh, doxycycline, uh, Simon told you about, it was very important to include or exclude as a treatment for LAM, and it doesn't look like it's going to be uh, an effective treatment going forward. There are several ideas for therapies that are add-ons to sirolimus, like hydroxychloroquine. Uh, in the laboratory, it looks like if you add sirolimus to this drug, which is uh, an anti-malarial uh, category drug used for lupus and other diseases, and it's quite safe, uh, the combination of those two things affect autophagy, which is a cellular process for maintaining uh, energy stores when there's no food around. Uh, if, if you use this drug together with sirolimus in the lab, it kills lamb cells. And it's being tested now in, in a trial in the United States that's close to enrollment and should be publishing soon. The TRAIL trial was a, a trial of letrozole in postmenopausal women with lamb. We were looking for 50 patients. We only got 18 to enroll. So we're not going to have conclusive uh, conclusions that uh, prove anything from that trial. We'll have some safety information. Um, the MILES trial published about the same time as this trial opened, and I think that compromised enrollment significantly. There's a sirolimus trial in Japan that was uh, a safety study that's uh, now being uh, reviewed for publication. Uh, statins are, are interesting in LAM. In the laboratory, they also seem to potentiate the effect of sirolimus in kill cells. Serocatinib is a brand new idea uh, that's just now uh, in phase two of a trial in the United States. It has, it's a drug that's been tested for cancer. Um, it's, uh, it's got considerable uh, toxicity profile, and uh, we're using it at a dose that's uh, moderate, so it should be uh, quite well tolerated in LAM patients, but we'll have to see that over the course of the trial. Um, MIDAS is this observational study I told you about. Inhaled sirolimus is an idea that's coming down the pike. This, uh, this Therapy is being developed by a company named LAM Therapeutics. Uh, they're, they're looking into launching trials throughout Europe, um, and we expect a first, the first patient to receive this drug by an inhaled route in this coming year. <clears throat> uh, Gleevec is uh, being tested in the United States. That's, a, that's the drug that's used for chronic myelogenous leukemia. There's a small trial opening in the United States uh, soon. Acelacoxib is an aspirin-like drug some reason to believe that aspirin-like therapies might be useful in killing lamb cells. Um, that'll open in Boston in the next few weeks. And then sirolimus is uh, being, well, proposed in the MILE trial, as I mentioned. A few extra ideas for trials that are, that are interesting. Resveratrol is the agent in red wine that uh, is an antioxidant and has a lot of properties attributed to it. <clears throat> You can't drink enough red wine to help lamb, but <laughs> you sh sure can try. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's used at doses that are you know, maybe 100 bottles of wine equivalent or something like that. Uh, and it's quite, quite safe. <laughs> quite safe. Uh, in the laboratory, it, together with sirolimus, it kills lamb cells. Um, that trial is, is be, has been written. And uh, an IND uh, is being applied for, so that, that'll probably be, t be launching in the next maybe 18 months or so. This purine synthesis, this DNA synthesis idea that I mentioned earlier, LAM, the LAM pathway, when it's gone haywire, drives DNA synthesis. If you poison DNA synthesis in that context, LAM cells don't like that, and they, they die in the lab. So that's an idea for there are therapies available that could possibly be taken off the shelf, they're approved by agencies like the EU, et cetera. I think mazorbine is used in, uh, in the U EU for some things. No, I was told that, but uh, methotrexate certainly is a drug we use a lot. Um, metformin is another idea. It's, it's sort of an mTOR inhibitor, like, uh, like sirolimus and, and, uh, and everolimus, and there have been a lot, there's been a lot of interest in this for a lot, long time but there's yet to be a trial in LAM. And then some ideas that are a little further down the pike. Sirolimus is pumped out of cells by transporters. If you could poison them, perhaps you, know, you could have a beneficial effect on LAM because the concentration of sirolimus would accumulate in LAM cells to higher levels. Uh, in LAM, the cells are, that are usually dependent on glucose for growth become addicted to glutamine for growth. So if you could starve cells of glutamine, Perhaps you, could, uh, perhaps you could have a treatment for LAM. Those are t tend to be on 
poorly tolerated therapies in animals, so it's, it's a distance, a long way before a human, I think, will get a glutamine inhibitor. And then this pathway, VEGFD, VEGFR3, which is its receptor, is very interesting, I think, in lamb, and there are lots of ideas for how to target that. So these are, these are the uh, ideas that I hear about for trials in the future. There are a lot of trials ongoing, which is you know, unbelievable for a disease this rare. So I, I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's every reason to be optimistic. These are the annual lung transplants for lamb in the United States, and they're now at their lowest level since 1998. Uh, that's, that's a very good thing. I, you know, I don't know if this is going to be a trend. I hope to see the dot for 2016 down here uh, or whether this is uh, you know, just a, a blip. But uh, it does have other implications. It's harder to get lung tissue now. There's only six events per year where lung tissue is available at transplants at transplant in the United States. So it becomes very important that we capitalize on every, every opportunity. Uh, the waiting list has stayed about the same. There's usually about 10 patients on the waiting list for transplant in the United States. And there have been roughly, um, oh, I don't know, 120 lamb trans per, per, for lamb since um, 1979. This is an issue that comes up a lot in meetings, uh, whether generics. Is the form of serolimus you get in the UK, is that the patented, the branded form? In the United States, often serolimus gets uh, uh, swapped, or the Rapimune, the branded agent, gets swapped for a generic form. Um, there's every reason to believe it's, it's as uh, effective and safe as the, as the branded form, but patients um, want to know for sure, and I, I think that's absolutely uh, a reasonable uh, request. So that's something we're going to be looking into, is, is trying to determine if the generic form is free of any contaminants, it's just as stable and just as effective as, as, as uh, the branded serolimus. So what's next? Um, for me, the most important thing is to refine the approach to suppressive therapy with mTOR inhibitors. And that's, that's really through this mild trial. And develop um, mechanisms for rapid, tri rapid trials throughout this LAM Foundation network. You can see with all these ideas for trials, the rate limiting factor is getting these mammoth undertakings up and going. You know, I think all of us have gained a healthy appreciation for how much work and troubleshooting there is in any one of these uh, studies that involves multiple centers. And uh, it, it's, we've got to develop a better way to find new drugs. And one way is to be sure we understand where the patients are and where, who's interested in trials and who has the right uh, set of eligibility criteria for trials so that we can approach people in a rapid, in a rap rapid way. And someday we're going to need some way to govern this because the trials are bumping into each other. These trials are all launching at the same time. No, every LAM trial in history so far is under-enrolled. So even Miles, we, we were looking for 120 patients. We got 89. Simon was, I th think you got two-thirds of the patients you wanted. And in, 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 the, in the trail trial, we, we got less than half the patients we needed. So uh, unless, unless we can improve uh, interest in trials at the late level of patients, we're not going to be able to find these, this cure that, that uh, Jan mentioned. Uh, and finally, the, the real brass ring is remission-inducing therapies where we actually kill lamb cells, not just suppress them. And uh, we can, I think that because they have these differences from normal cells, there are targets that we've got uh, that have a lot of promise. And, there, there, uh, there's a lot of reasons to believe that we can, we can find a therapy that will kill lamb cells instead of just suppress them. I think I'm going to skip this one because I mentioned it. Um, in terms of refining the approach to the use of mTOR inhibitors, uh, providing access to the drug for all is a, an important priority for me, and that, that starts with FDA approval because that leads to approval in countries where you can't get the drug unless it is approved. So in Japan, you, the government won't pay for it unless it's on their approved <coughs> list for that disease. So uh, getting drug approval there is all important, and in Korea, and in China. It's not, it's not the same in the UK, um, but it, it does have other benefits. So uh, these regulatory approvals, I think, are very important. Personalized dosing, we talked about. That's very important. Determine, determining if early treatment for, prevents progression determining if the drug can be safely given over long periods of time, and finding markers that allow us to determine who will progress and who will respond. 
Uh, these are the pathways that could constitute Achilles heels for lamb cells. All of these pathways that involve synthesis of proteins and lipids and protein degradation and nucleotide synthesis, DNA synthesis, they're all turned on in the lamb cell. And every one of them is, is targetable uh, with drugs that are already FDA approved for other indications. So uh, there, are, there are lots of drugs to test. And really, the rate limiting step is going to be getting trials together that, to, to do the testing. We really need a way to estimate the total body burden of lamb cells. This is a PET scan where we give people radioactive sugar, and then we put a camera over them to collect, uh, uh, collect the image. And uh, the radioactivity concentrates in areas where cancer cells are taking up the sugar very avidly. This, I forget what this tumor is, but you can see that it is extensively involving the neck and the center of the chest. Uh, this was after therapy. You can see that this therapy was very effective. All of that is gone. We need something like this for LAM. This is a better endpoint than lung function. Uh, th th it is conceivable we could develop a PET scan for LAM, but uh, it's, it's going to require some research. Uh, it isn't going to be easy as, as radio-labeled sugar. So I have a few uh, words from uh, Sue Sherman, the new chairman of the LAM Foundation. Uh, this is her. Uh, she started about two years ago, and she's terrific. She's uh, has this warm message of welcome, which I don't think I'll read to you, but it will be available. We'll make these slides available after the, the talk if you'd like to read it. She just thanks uh, Lamb Action for all they've done for Lamb and Nottingham for all that it's done for Lamb Research. And um, she wanted me to share a couple of, of uh, things that are going on in the foundation with you. So over the course of this 10-year period from 95, or 20 year period from 95 to 2015, the foundation has raised about 21 million and devoted more than half of that to uh, research, uh, mostly to the research portfolio, but other, uh, also to trials and scientific meetings. It's funded about 120 projects and 77 unique investigators. Uh, it has a 31-member scientific advisory board. The, uh, Rare lung disease meeting I'm going to talk about a little bit. There's the Lamposium this year is a little bit different. Uh, there's a, uh, an effort, there's a patient that's going on a worldwide tour to meet Lamb patients all over the world, uh, Sarah Poitras, uh, that's going to begin soon. Uh, Sue Sherman's headed to Brazil to try and help with getting approval for Sirolimus in Brazil. Uh, we are anxious to expand this global uh, Lamb clinic and research network. Uh, there's a lung procurement, tissue procurement task force in the United States, much like what I heard about from Jan. Uh, and there's an oxygen access t task force. There's a crisis in oxygen access in the United States that's been driven by some changes with Medicare and Medicaid that, uh, that has really made it difficult for some lamb patients to get their oxygen. So the foundation is very active at working, working on that issue. The, this network of LAM clinics has opened its doors to other rare lung diseases. These are now the 20 or so rare lung diseases that are being tracked in these clinics. Uh, many of them have uh, single gene explanations and are very targetable and, and treatable. The, um, these are the numbers of patients followed in those clinics. Uh, one that I've become interested in, uh, not just because it rhymes with LAM, but because it has a, a, a single gene defect, uh, is called alveolar microlithiasis, and it's been very helpful and useful to me. I've been able to find 50 or so patients with this disease around the world and to collect samples and, and, and to put studies together for this other rare disease that I think also uh, could, could, could end up with a treatment in the next 10 years or so. But this has been very helpful for, in a collaborative way for, for learning from other groups, having them learn, learn from us, uh, sharing uh, ideas. It's been, it's been tremendously helpful. And this is really the basis for the Rare Lung Disease Consortium meeting that I'll tell you about in just a minute. Lamb Foundation has revamped its, uh, its website. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing in the last six months or so is improving the Wikipedia site. Because if you're diagnosed with Lamb in, I don't know, Senegal, uh, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to read, you're going to go online, and you're going to look for an authoritative source. And Wikipedia is a window uh, on the world. It's sometimes accurate, sometimes not. But uh, we've tried to make uh, the Lamb piece very accurate, and we've asked for uh, authorship from all over the world. Simon wrote a piece. Uh, other people have put together uh, pieces for this. And it's now uh, a very complete um, source of information for people, people with LAM, interested in LAM. It gets about uh, 250 hits per day. You can you look at this yourself. There's a little history calculator on the Wikipedia page. Uh, there was a surge on this day. I don't know. We're going to have to try to repeat whatever that was. 
but um, mostly it's about 250 hits per day. And this other disease that I'm interested in, before the Wikipedia page, we were getting about four hits a day, and now we're up to about seven hits a day, so I think we're heading up. Uh, we've also embedded this little sentence at the end of the Wikipedia page that if you're interested in hearing about trials, that you can sign up on this privacy protected site. Uh, that's, that's an NIH uh, to tool. I, I don't know, I can't know who these people are that sign up on the site, but if I want to get them a message that there's a trial coming, they're, they're on this listserv basically and put the message out. So they don't have to join anything. All I have to do is say, I'd like to hear about anything, come, any new progress or any n news about, about this disease. So we're hoping that this will become a mechanism for basically increasing recruitment for all kinds of efforts uh, for this disease, for Lyme and for, for PAM and, and other diseases. And scientists all over the world can make uh, use of this. If you're interested in PAM and you're from Japan, you can ask to, to address the population of people who've signed up for learning about uh, PAM. The Lamb Foundation holds these uh, regional conferences that are, uh, that are one of Sue uh, Sherman's signature uh, new ideas, which is to go to cities. Instead of having the, everybody come to Cincinnati for the Lamb Conference, she goes to them. And uh, they have conferences uh, that are usually composed of about 20 or 30 patients and the Lamb Clinic director from that site uh, and uh, host little mini, mini symposiums. Um, She's visited uh, many, all of these LAM clinics shown at the bottom of the um, screen since ATS 2015. So she's been uh, traveling a lot. Um, these liaison groups are, have also been a very useful construct. These are, the United States is carved up into um, 21 regions. Uh, and uh, there are liaison meetings that, uh, that occur in these uh, in these regions, there have been about 31 meetings in 2015, many in conjunction with the LAM clinics in their area, and it's, it provides very nice personalized support for LAM patients and their families. These are the, the LAM meetings that, uh, that are recently completed and coming up. So the LAM, was in, LAM meeting was in Cincinnati for most of the last 20 years, but it moved to Chicago for three or four years, and now it's back in Cincinnati. Uh, for the rare lung disease meeting, and this is going to be a combined meeting, as I'll show you in a moment. We had a, a specialty meeting called a biomarker meeting, which was, uh, Simon was there as well in Atlanta. Uh, it, was a, it was an effort to, to get together and brainstorm about biomarkers and then uh, put together uh, a, a, a grant funding program for people to apply to that had been at that meeting uh, to develop, fully develop their ideas develop, that, they, that they brought, it up, brought up there. Uh, and that we've yet to see the sort of the downstream benefits of, of those projects, but we're hoping to uh, hear from uh, here in form of publications very soon. Uh, there's going to be a combined tuberous sclerosis lab meeting in DC. There's going to be a patient benefit meeting on the West Coast. And the idea behind this meeting is that, pay, that uh, investigators will be asked to propose studies that uh, could come to patient benefit within five years. <laughs> And um, that forces people to think in a very translational mode. This idea of, of basically developing VEGFD as a personalized dosing biomarker, that potentially could be accomplished in five years, something like that. Um, so um, I'm very excited about this idea. Uh, we're going to hold it on the West Coast just to be, give better access to people who haven't been able to come east for the LAM meeting. There'll be another LAMposium in Chicago in 2018. Uh, I think Jan already showed a picture. There's usually about 120. I think the most ever was 150 LAM patients and about an equal number of uh, family members that, uh, that have come to the uh, LAM meeting in the past. This year it's going to be held together with other rare lung disease groups that, that I showed you earlier. Uh, there's going to be a first day of the meeting that's devoted to having our clinic directors updated about rare lung diseases, about a 15 or 20 rare lung diseases. Uh, there'll be a typical uh, celebration banquet that evening. Our speaker is Frank Sazanowski, who used to be the head of the National Organization of Rare Diseases and who has a rare disease himself. Um, and uh, then we'll have a, a typical LAM meeting on Saturday and other rare disease groups will be getting together to discuss trials and their rare diseases. Uh, we'll have a, a, the typical gala on Saturday night and then a, a LAM Clinic Director Congress on Sunday uh, for a four-hour period just to talk about collaborative projects we could do together. The foundation has raised $50,000 to bring people 
uh, in from lamb clinics around the world. So Simon's an invited speaker and he's fully covered, but he has $1,000. If he wants to bring somebody with him from the lamb clinic, there's, a, there's partial coverage for, for that person if the site can muster the other piece. So it, it's, we'd like to have not just doctors there, we want clinic uh, nurses and research coordinators to come. Um, so uh, you know, we hope people will take full advantage of that. Um, these are the LAMF Foundation uh, grant program. So we have our typical uh, grant program that, that gives away about $350,000 a year. These are um, now uh, awarded through a face-to-face -face study section, which means that we bring in our 10 scientists or so that talk about the grant applications face-to-face. And it, that's a very uh, useful mechanism for sorting out which grants should be funded because um, you, know, the, you feel very uh, obligated to go through these grants in great detail and to defend them or criticize them to your colleagues in a way that uh, is fair and, and, and basically yields the best possible uh, slate of grants for funding. Uh, there's going to be a pilot clinical trial, RFA, $50,000 trial. Uh, RFA coming out in the next month or so. So if you have an idea that you'd like to get safety data on a drug like metformin and would like to pose a, propose a small trial, there will be $50,000 for that. And there's now a coordinated effort with the University of Pennsylvania. It's a million dollar bike ride that uh, has been raising about $100,000 a year that is distributed by them. Uh, their, their scientists do the reviewing and distri distribution, but these grants are devoted, devoted to LAM. These are, the, this is the, these are the awards for 2014 and 2015, and, and as Jan mentioned, Debbie Clements received an award in 2014, uh, and Simon is going to be the grant program chair. I think he had a beer in him when, I, when he agreed to this. I have to confirm that, but I think he's going to be the grant program chair in 2017. And, and one of the ideas behind rotating LAM Foundation meeting uh, chairs and LAM Foundation grant uh, program chairs is just to sort of eliminate biases so we can have a different chair every year. I didn't even attend the, the grant session last year just to have fresh, you know, fresh eyes on all the grants. Um, but uh, you know, that's, that's one of the principles of the foundation is we like to uh, you know, be viewed as a very fair, equitable organization. Uh, these are some examples of recent publications. Most of them, uh, they're too detailed here to go into, but most of them deal with targets that are interesting. Uh, the first one about how to isolate lamb cells from the lung. The second one about a drug called axitinib, which looks very promising. Um, the third one about a new gene that looks, or fourth one about a new gene that looks promising in, in lamb. And then this uh, by Lindsay Hoy. The, fourth, the third one is a, an anesthesiologist with lamb who, who told her story in the medical literature in this journal called Anesthesiology. It was very moving. I encourage everybody to read that. And if, if you can't find it or it's not accessible to you, just uh, write to the foundation and they can send it, the Lamb Foundation. Um, these are other high profile uh, publications in the, in the best journals, Cell, Journal of Experimental Medicine, all funded by patients. Uh, glutamine, uh, glutamine is a target, uh, prostaglandins is a target, an aspirin-like target, and also uh, estrogen targets, uh, all, all outlined in these articles. So what, what do I tell new patients? I tell them there's every reason to be optimistic. We have an effective therapy, that this drug effectively suppresses LAM in the same way as blood pressure medicine suppresses hypertension or statins suppress cholesterol. So I see in publications that this drug is, rest, is listed as it's only partially effective. But we don't describe statins that way. I mean, they suppress their target. If you stop the statin, your cholesterol goes back up. So these are suppressive drugs. They're not inferior drugs. They're useful for this disease. They're, we, we need to do better. We need to find remission-inducing drugs. But this is a very, very nice first step. Uh, the best scientists in the world are interested in the LAM pathway, and the rate of progress has been astounding. So what can a patient do? Enroll in trials is number one, two, three to me. Uh, donate research data and samples. Answer the queries from the LAM, LAM action and, and, and the LAM Foundation. Uh, this has been very helpful to even writing grants. If I'm trying to figure out how many patients might be interested in a trial with a certain drug, the LAM Foundation sends out a query to all 800 people that are in, on the listserv, and we get three or 400 responses in a day. And I can include that in the grant application. I can say that when I asked whether people were interested in seracatinib, 90% of people wanted to hear more. 
that, that helps with getting grants funded and trials started. So it's really important that LAM patients participate. And Jan was mentioning this. This membership thing is so, or actually it was Kelly, that uh, it's membership is, oh no, both, both of you. <laughs> but uh, membership is so important. Uh, and in, unless, unless this organization can speak uh, for the whole LAM pop population in, in the UK, it's not, as, it's not as strong. It's very important that, pa that patients join and participate. And we try to encourage all our patients to attend a LAM clinic at least once a year. And I think I'll stop there. <laughs>